Welcome into episode number eight of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. I'm Matt Dean, broadcaster and communications coordinator for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers, the advanced day affiliate of the Houston Astros. This episode spans June the 28th through the week of July the 4th. So we hope that uh, you are maybe right now enjoying a nice backyard cookout, enjoying a July 4th holiday, uh, even in the absence of baseball. We've got some mixed feelings Uh, For our holiday weekend episode, of course, some more somber news that the minor league baseball 2020 season was officially canceled this week, as announced uh, by Pat O'Connor, president of minor league baseball. Uh, The Fayetteville Woodpeckers, of course, us putting out our statement in support of that decision. Felt like it was a long time coming. We'll talk about that a little bit with Dan O'Neill, the Senior Director of Business Operations for the Astros, who oversees the Astros-owned minor league properties, including us uh, here in Fayetteville. Dan will reflect on the cancellation of the minor league baseball season this week, but we're going to keep it positive too because we will have some baseball on TV to watch pretty soon, and we're excited to welcome one of the members of the Astros' initial 60-man player pool eligible to participate in the 2020 Major League season. He played for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers last season, Colton Shaver, one of 13 former Fayetteville Woodpeckers on the Astros' initial player pool heading into this year. So we'll have kind of the front office perspective from Dan O'Neill on the look ahead at the Major League season, and we'll also have the player perspective of Colton Shaver uh, just getting into town this week, and he is itching and ready to get back on the field uh, and have a go resuming baseball activities in an official capacity uh, later on this weekend as uh, the players all converge on Houston, uh, trying to make sure everyone's healthy, staying safe, and socially distant as much as possible. Uh, and it sounds like players going to resume baseball activities sometime in the next week. So our two guests, Colton Shaver, catcher, who had himself a phenomenal season, uh, started out with the Fayetteville Woodpeckers, had a really good first half, and then just went off in the second half. I'll mention a stat in that interview about Colton Shaver, who's one of the 13 former Woodpeckers that are on that initial 60-man player pool for the Astros. He had a 21-homer season in total between the Carolina League and Texas League you look at the list of guys to hit at least 20 homers in the minors last year. If you take out guys that spent time in AAA where they had the juiced baseball, the, the Major League Baseball, uh, that they added to AAA and the home run totals exploded last year, it is a very exclusive list and a pretty interesting list uh, of guys that got to at least 20 homers last season. I make reference to it in the interview. Uh, our guest, Colton Shaver, was one of 20 20 homer hitters who did not spend time in AAA or the major leagues last uh, last season. There's a lot of interesting names on that list. It's headlined by Mason Martin in the Pittsburgh Pirates system. He mashed 35 dingers between the low A South Atlantic League uh, and high A last season while a member uh, of the Pirates organization went down to Bradenton, finished out the year in the Florida State League. Uh, A lot of good prospects on here. Sam Huff of the Rangers, who was in the Futures game, a really good power-hitting catcher. Uh, He hit 28, was third on the list. Luan Diaz, uh, 27 homers. Seth Beer, a friend of the podcast, two guys involved in trades. Jeter Downs, who was the big prospect piece of the Mookie Betts trade. Uh, going from the Dodgers to Boston. He had 24 homers last year. Uh, Tristan Casas, uh, one of the top prospects in the Red Sox organization. Jared Kelnick uh, of the Mariners had 23. A uh, really impressive list of guys that Colton Shaver is a part of as well. Another former Woodpecker, Jake Adams, uh, one of the 20, 20 homer hitters who did not spend Uh, time in AAA or the majors last season. Guys to hit at least 20 home runs in the minors without AAA experience last season. Uh, We'll take a look at the list of the other Woodpeckers that did make the 2020 player pool for the Astros. They'll have a crack at the major leagues. Brian Abreu is first on the list alphabetically, and I think number one on our excitement level at least. If you are a fan of the podcast and a regular listener, you heard, I think it was episode three when we had the Astros pitching coach 
uh, Brent Strom on as a guest. We asked him about Brian Abreu, one of the talented young pitching prospects that came through Fayetteville last season, a major league plus-plus breaking ball that uh, Brent Strom just gushed about. He is very high on the guy, so go back and listen to episode number three uh, about Brian Abreu if you missed that already. Uh, He's a guy that uh, might have a chance to see him coming out of the bullpen, certainly with the expanded rosters for this season. Two friends of the pod as well, too. Uh, Sean Dubin, another pitcher who had a really standout season with the Fayetteville Woodpeckers last season. He is now in Houston and on that 60-man player pool. Michael Papierski, the catcher out of LSU. Colton Shaver, who we said is our guest on the show today. Jake Myers, who we already mentioned with a nice 22-homer campaign last year. Uh, an outfielder on the list. So three position players, the rest are pitchers. We mentioned Brian Abreu, Brett Conine, who spent some time with the Woodpeckers last season. Impressive strikeout totals for him. Luis Garcia was an absolute horse for the Woodpeckers, especially in the postseason. He turned in a spectacular performance, and he was averaging close to 13 strikeouts per nine last season. Christian Javier had a brief start of the season in Fayetteville before he soared through the ranks of the minor leagues, Enoli Paredes, Siono Perez, Nivaldo Rodriguez, Johansi Torres, another phenomenal pitcher for the Woodpeckers last season, and then Forrest Whitley, who made a couple of rehab starts as a member of the Woodpeckers last season, the Astros' top prospect heading into the season. No surprise to see Forrest Whitley on the list of guys headed to spring training 2.0, the summer camp the Astros are just having underway Uh, this week. So 13 former Woodpeckers on that Astros initial player pool. We get to talk to one of them, Colton Shaver, our guest on the Woodpeckers baseball podcast on the other side. Episode number eight starts right now. Okay, and I'm excited to welcome my next guest. He is a corner infielder, catcher for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers for part of last season. Uh, Originally, he was a 39th round pick out of BYU by the Astros in 2017. He was a freshman All-American, two-time All-Conference pick. He hit 21 home runs last year between the Woodpeckers and AA Corpus Christi. And we're excited to have Colton Shaver on the podcast today. He is one of 13 former Woodpeckers who was on the Astros' initial player pool, uh, the 60-man pool for the 2020 season. So first off, Colton, congratulations on getting the opportunity to go to summer camp, spring training 2.0, whatever you guys are calling it. Uh, So congrats. Thanks for being here. And just let our listeners know, how did you kind of find out? Did you have any idea of your chances of of getting the opportunity down in Houston and, and just how excited you are? Well, thanks for having me. First off, it's, you know, it's been a crazy year. 2020 has been a mess. So it was kind of that whole situation with COVID and everything, kind of just sit back and wait to see what happens because we haven't gone through this. So we don't really know what to do. And I know from the front office as, uh, aspect of it and through MLB, it's like this is something completely new. So I kind of just did my thing and worked out and tried to stay as ready as I could until we got the call back. So I never really knew when we were going back. Uh, as things started getting closer and I saw negotiations, you know, I was just prepared for if I did get a call or if I didn't, it's kind of hard to say with how this works. So I just try to stay as prepared as I thought I could be and try to be ready to go whenever I did get the call. What have you been doing to stay in shape? Different guys have been in different situations. You know, they're going back to their hometown. Some of them are near their college town or high school had some guys to work out with places what what kind of equipment did you have and, and what kind of schedule did you kind of try to keep especially early on when everybody was sent home and a lot of things were closed what was kind of your routine or semblance of it to stay ready for for a season well due to me living in salt lake it was such a i drove out to spring training um i spend every january february in houston working out and kind of getting ready so i drove out there I, I didn't know how long this whole quarantine and pause on baseball was going to last. So I wanted to stay in Florida so I didn't drive all the way back to Salt Lake and turn around and have to drive back again. So I just stayed out there. I went and bought me a, a barbell and some, some just plate weights just to go on the barbell. 
And it wasn't ideal, but it worked. And I was able to do some stuff out there just with a barbell in the backyard. And I made, I made it work. I had some buddies that lived in where I was at in Florida as well. So we were able to go hit a high school field and be out on the field every day, training, working our baseball side of it. The gym aspect of it is probably one of the most important parts. And that was the hardest part because even once states started opening up, it was still hard to get in there. There was a lot of, um, I guess, regulations and rules on how many people can be in, how many people can be there at one time, so like how long you can be there to work out. And it made it difficult. Um, so at that point, I decided, you know what, I am going to drive home. So I did drive home. And I do have a guy back home that I work out with who I started going and He's awesome. Um, he, he sits there and tries to get me the best to the best of my abilities. And he's worked with a lot of college and pro guys out of Utah. So he kind of put together a special class for us so we can sit there and go long and be able to get all of our work in. But it kind of took a while before I was like, you know what, it is time to start driving home. So I made that three day trek to get back to Utah from Florida. No, definitely a wild few months, and, and you certainly didn't know how long it was going to last, anything like that. Uh, so it's it's definitely good perspective. I think a lot of, of people were, were going through a similar experience uh, this time of year. So now you're you're in Houston, so you just get into town this week on Monday, you were saying, before uh, we just started uh, recording here. Uh, what's your schedule been like? Uh, you said you're basically not reporting to the ballpark to really do anything in, until later on this weekend. What's kind of the last few weeks been? When did you hear that you were added to the pool, booked your flight, et cetera? How'd you get to Houston and, and what are you looking forward to and when camp does start up this weekend? So I got here Monday. Um, I found out that earlier that weekend, so it was all kind of the same weekend when negotiations hit, we agreed on terms, kind of had a procedure of what we were going to do with everything and then they ended up giving us a call so I I drove from southern Utah um, I was down out there watching my sister have a softball tournament they started up in Utah we started the youth started to do tournaments and stuff which was nice so I went there, down there to watch her play softball I got the call so it was a, it was nice because I was four hours closer but I just ended up just driving I had my pet my car packed already so I just drove from southern utah to houston and it, it's, a, it's a long drive but it wasn't too bad it was pretty quick um we got out here and they had to make sure that we were all safe before we were able to intermingle with everyone coming from different parts of the country and i guess different parts of the world so we had to really make sure that everyone went through the tests came back got the test results so we've been staying pretty distant from each other just to make sure just being smart, basic protocols. We just, we don't want to put ourselves at risk. And that's kind of just how this has been going right now until everyone gets all the results. And then we report tomorrow to really start doing the baseball side of it. How are you approaching the opportunity that you have here in camp? Obviously you're, you're on the doorstep of, of being able to play in the major leagues when, when you maybe you weren't even expecting you would have a chance to play baseball this year uh, but as you're in camp what are you focusing on or how are you going to use this experience to to at least be around some of the big league guys soak up some of the experience that they have how are you approaching uh, this opportunity these next few weeks well our big league guys are awesome I've said that since the year I got drafted they're very well tuned with they went through the same experience of a minor leaguer they know how it is to be a minor leaguer and they like to give back and they're very, they're very nice. They're easy to be around. They make you feel like you belong you're comfortable. So which makes you play better. And so the camaraderie, camaraderie is awesome between our big league guys and our minor league guys. And I'm just really excited just to get out here and just start doing baseball again. It's been hard just training and practicing in an indoor cage or hitting on a field when you don't know what's happening. So I'm excited to get back out there and get ready again for competitive baseball. I have no doubt that I'm ready to play. My body feels great. I'm healthy. So I'm ready to get back out there, and I'm ready to just get back to the competitive aspect of it. You're listed on the player pool as a catcher, which is a position that's still relatively new to you. You had 29 starts in the minors last year with the position. Uh, I saw you had some experience catching a little bit in the Cape Cod League. You had a really nice season that that I think drew the attention of, of the Astros and some other teams when you were playing in the Cape in 2016 when did the Astros approach you about the possibility of catching 
and how did that experience overall go getting that workload in last season at the position? Well, the funny thing with catching is that is my primary position all the way through college. That's what I've done. That's what I've, I've never done anything but catch. Like, yeah, of course I pitched every kid pitches in high school, but I was a catcher. That's what I was recruited as. And once I got to college, we had a couple of catchers that were also really good. So I just, I wrote the DH for life and nobody really knew I caught. So catching's always been kind of my specialty. It's kind of been my love for the sport. And I love playing baseball. Third base is amazing. First base is amazing. I can, I enjoy playing anywhere, but catching is kind of like my passion in it. So I, we brought it up. We kind of talked about it. They asked, you know, hey, what, what do you think about catching? I'm like, that's, that's where I want to be. And it, it was just really good to be able to have that, that calm conversation with our front office and be able to sit there and be like, you know, this is what I'd like to do. And they agreed. And I think it's a, I think it's a good spot to move forward in. That's really cool. I mean, obviously you were familiar with it. I, I didn't even know that you were a catcher primarily in high school uh, coming into this thing. It's it's a little bit different in pro ball. Did you find yourself having an adjustment period of getting back into the groove of it? And then what? how, how much different is it with receiving in the velocity that you were seeing catching and getting back into it last season? So it's I feel like it's not that big of a difference. Um, if you can catch a baseball, if you're used to seeing guys throwing hard as a hitter. You know, you're, you're used to them throwing the ball hard at you. And it's not so much getting back into it. It's just getting comfortable with your pitchers again. You know, understanding how they throw, what they, what they do, what they like, what they don't like. And that's kind of the, the learning curve that you get moving positions in pro ball. Because every guy is different. Every guy has their own attack plan. According to what our attack plan is for each hitter. And... That's the funnest part for me back there when I'm catching is dissecting the game on how to get a hitter out with my pitcher's strengths or even using my pitcher's weakness to get the guy out because sometimes you have to do that. So that's, that's the part that I really enjoy, and that's the part that I think is the biggest learning curve for most catchers, which for me that's something I'm like I'm eager to, to get in and dive into. That's kind of that muddy waters where it's like, oh, I just made a bad pitch and I cost my pitcher and now two runs on a home run. Or if I would have called, you know, a pitch that was a little bit different, we would have been on the same plan. He could have gone out of there with three strikeouts in the inning. So that's, that's kind of that fine line that you walk as a catcher, which is the learning curve and typically that most people talk about. It's a position, too, where, where leadership qualities a lot of times are, are emphasized. Is that something that – that you feel like is a strong suit or something that you're working on? I mean, you kind of mentioned it too with the strategy and, and communicating with your pitcher, uh, but how important are the leadership uh, capabilities in the position and and how are you working on that aspect of the game too? I mean, leadership's big all over the field. You know, it's it's that game that's like the individual, the individualism within a team sport. So the leadership is very important to be able to command the field, but at the same time, your third baseman's commanding the field, the shortstop, the first baseman, the manager, even guys on the bench will throw out little tips and cues. So the leadership aspect of it, it's more between, you know, seeing where our field is set up and being able to have that strong faith that the pitcher trusts me. So I feel like that's kind of in those leadership skills where it's like I know the pitcher trusts me. He knows I'm working hard for him. And that's where it's like kind of that, like that silent leader in a way where, you know, I, all I do is I work hard for my pitcher and I work hard for my team to get them on and off the field as fast as possible. So that's, that's my job back there. So that's, that's kind of how I think about things. I try to stay silent back there as much as possible, talk to my pitchers and just, you know, a catcher had a good game when you didn't even notice him. So I try to be that guy that's just unnoticed back there, knowing that he had a good game. Catching's obviously opened up some new opportunities for you in the game with, with some versatility and, and going back to that that position that you're used to. Uh, you, you did yourself a lot of favors, too, with, with what you did at the plate last season, too, as well as catching. Uh, you had a nice start to the season in Fayetteville, uh, six home runs. You just went off in the second half. You, you had 15 home runs in double A to the second half of last season. It, it's a pretty good, you know, total to put up for home runs but like in triple a last year the numbers just went through the ceiling so i feel like it kind of got lost in the shuffle uh, i looked at the list of guys that hit 20 at least 20 homers last year in the minors that when you take out the guys that played in triple a it's like 
20 some guys that, that you were a part of. So it's a pretty, pretty special season. You didn't get the major league baseball that just exploded the home run totals in triple a last season. Uh, what, what clicked for you in the second half? You didn't have the aid of the major league baseball, like the guys in triple a did. So you obviously figured something out, uh, and, and it really showed in the power department. What, what did you feel like went well for you? And especially in that second half takeoff. It, it all comes down to approach. My big thing at the plate, especially in the second half, was I just tried to hit it a little bit higher. Um, in Fayetteville, everything was on a line. There were low-line drives, which is awesome. That's how I like to hit. And I was getting a lot of doubles in Fayetteville. So Fayetteville, was, I was crushing on the double side of it. And then once I was able to get called up go to Corpus, I really tried to refine my approach to hit it a little bit higher. So I just I swung at balls and I just had that mental awareness. I'm just like, you know what? I need to hit it a little bit higher. If I fly out, I fly out. But I need to get it up in the air just a little bit more. And I think that's what really helped. Absolutely. I mean, you hear it so much more now in the game of of guys talking about trying to hit it in the air. Some guys don't think of it that way, but that's kind of the the result, I guess, that that they're maybe going for, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. Uh, how important is it to to for hitters that are early on in their career or early in their minor league career? Did you feel like you had to lay the foundation of hitting, going with the line drive approach? Is that like a first step where you have to have that as a foundation before you build on to, you know, tailoring your swing maybe for a little bit more of a fly ball approach? I mean, absolutely. Like as a youth, your first goal is just to even touch it. You know, trying to put the ball in play, that's the first step. And then you, that's where you really build. And having that confidence that the ball's in the strike zone, you're going to hit it. So, like, there's a lot of ways you can approach it. But I, I truly believe, you know, the line drive to the opposite field gap. So, for a righty, it'd be right center. For a left-handed hitter, it'd be left center. And that just kind of keeps your body in the correct position to be able to drive through a baseball and, cre- and create a good foundation to really provide a lot of power behind it. Great. Uh, last thing I got for you, as people are so excited for baseball to be back. Everybody's just starving for some baseball coming out. What kind of uh, you know feedback have you heard from from friends, family, people reaching out? Like, has word been kind of getting around in Utah that that you're on the the sixty man player pool? You're you're going to camp in Houston. How excited are is kind of your your corner uh, of the country or folks that you know reaching out? What's what's the response been like? You know, Utah, we have a few of our professional players uh, around the organizations. We do have a few in Utah. So you kind of have that community, and it was awesome to hear. You know, there, there's some congratulations. There's some excitement. There's also a lot that are just saying, keep working. You know, it's, now it's time to really put in the work. And that comes from more of my kind of my cornerstone when it comes to my foundation, my little group that I've been with since I was eight years old. They're the ones that go in there and just, you know, if I go home and I need somebody to throw to me, I can call up one of our five guys and they'll come throw to me no matter how old they are. So that part's the cool part is that Utah, there is a lot of, there's a lot of backing, a lot of support that comes out of the state and that there's a lot of people reaching out and giving their love for it. But there are also a lot of people saying now it's time to really get after it. All right. We got to want to again, thank our guest uh, on the Woodpeckers baseball podcast, catcher corner infielder for the Woodpeckers last season, Colton Shaver, Colton, good luck uh, with, Spring training 2.0, we hope to see you on the field and, and looking forward to it when baseball gets back in a few weeks. Thank you, and thanks for having me. All right, my next guest is the Senior Director of Business Operations for the Houston Astros. He oversees the Astros-owned minor league properties, including the Woodpeckers here in Fayetteville, as well as AA Corpus Christi, the spring training facility, and minor league park down in West Palm as well, too. Uh, he is an Illinois native, former minor league ball player with the Phillies, old 27th round pick uh, back in 1999, spent a couple seasons in the minor leagues. Dan O'Neill uh, is my guest on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. Uh, Dan, one of the things I like about the podcast is I have to kind of do a semi-deep dive into people's backgrounds, so I learned a lot of that stuff about you, but just had to dump it there for a second. You're from Illinois. My parents are U of I grads. So it was cool to kind of connect with you a little bit on that. And uh, yeah, and look back at, at some of the minor league cities that you hopped around in during your brief career back in the day. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. You definitely did some digging if you uh, you got down into the 27th round. I like to tell people that 
if I played in today's modern stat world, I probably would have been a fifth or sixth round pick just because my on base percentage was so good. But uh, we'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know. And either way, I didn't wasn't good enough to play in the big leagues, so uh, doesn't really matter. But yeah, I definitely bounced around. I have a, a, a soft spot for minor league baseball in in my heart, and um, you know, spent two long laborious years trying to 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 grind it out and. Definitely had to stop. Uh, I was in the Penn League. I was in the Florida State League, Gulf Coast League, and then actually was in the, the South Atlantic League, and I was in North Carolina in Kannapolis, of all places, which uh, we know well. The old Piedmont Bull Weevils. Yeah, exactly. Great name. And then, and then uh, yeah, you, you, hit, you hit it on the head. From Champaign, Illinois, played college baseball at the University of Illinois, and, and um, obviously grew up in a college town, so big Illini fan, so I won't hold it against you that you've got Badger – gear all over your office so <laughs> your parent your parents went there so i'm gonna let you off the hook i yeah i do have a little bit of a soft spot for the university of illinois and we were talking to like wisconsin doesn't have a baseball team so i'm fine with pledging my loyalty in the big 10 to university of illinois for baseball only um yeah and, and you have just like a unique connection to the minor leagues you've you've overseen uh the, the minor league operations that that the astros own the last few years you yourself played in the minors for a couple seasons in, in North Carolina, like we said, in, in Kannapolis. So you kind of have a personal connection to, to what minor league baseball means for a lot of smaller communities. It's kind of been a long time coming with, with the announcement this week that, that the minor league season was canceled, but I think a lot of people were expecting it and ready for it, but still it was just kind of a little bit of a dark day. So what was kind of your reaction and how you were processing the news this week when it, when it finally kind of officially came out that the season was canceled. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately I wasn't surprised, but this has been a buildup over the last several months and, you know, going back to March and spring training, when we, when we put a pause on, you know, send all the players home, I think, you know, we, we were definitely optimistic and, and at the same time, you know, uncertain as to what was going to happen with the pandemic. And then, you know, as obviously it grew and spread throughout the country, throughout the world, you saw various, um, you know, peaks in different cities, uh, it became, you know, it became a harsh reality that this was going to be very challenging to pull off a minor league season. And then, you know, there's 160 cities in minor league baseball. There's only 30 in major league baseball. So when you just think, you just think about that and the different local governments that have their different rules and the different types of spread throughout and levels of infection, you know, as it became more and more clear over, April and May that, you know, this was very challenging, very challenging for just to, to contain the virus. But, you know, thinking about getting business back to normal was kind of almost unthought of at that point. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, that we can get past it quickly. But yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was disappointing. You know, we have lots of friends in minor league baseball, obviously our staff in Fayetteville and our fans, it's going to be disappointing for them. But then just all of us throughout baseball, it's um, it's a tough blow, and it's going to affect a lot of people uh, even more than than the the COVID virus has affected people already. So uh, definitely, definitely disappointing and sad day. Uh, but we gotta we gotta focus on what we can do to to make it to make 2021 that much that much better. But we we do have some baseball, of course, to to talk about coming up and. You're going to stay plenty busy with the way that the Astros are, are using some of their minor league facilities, getting ready for the major league season that's going to start uh, at the end of the month here. So right now, this week, players have, have already been reporting uh, to summer camp, the new spring training 2.0, whatever you want to call it this week. Uh, so you have the 60-man the player pool, which all the major league teams put out this week. Uh, basically guys that are going to be eligible to play in the majors this year. And right now, the Astros are using a couple of different facilities to get the guys ready, prepared for the season. Uh, Whataburger Field, the AA ballpark in Corpus, is going to be used for the taxi squad. And so basically, what, what are the kind of the mechanics behind the scenes that are going on right now, getting the players on the 60-man player pool into town, using Minute Maid Park? They're even using the University of Houston a little bit. What, what has that been like? Because it just sounds like that's crazy, juggling all those pieces right now. Yeah, and, and that's the other factor uh, as to why the minor league season was kind of forced to be canceled. One, it was the this, the you know, 160 jurisdictions or, or 
locations where it'd be hard to to get everyone on the same page to play. The second was once Major League Baseball decided that they really needed to increase the roster to enhance flexibility, uh, not only from a health perspective, player health perspective as far as not having the appropriate spring training build up pitchers aren't going to be built up to run out for six or seven innings um, and then obviously the effects of any <clears throat> potential covid exposure or infection among rosters major league baseball decided to change the rules to change how rosters are used in 2020 and uh, you hit on it there's going to be a a 60 player player pool <clears throat> which each team can draw from and any of those players in the 60, 60 man list can contribute to the championship club throughout the championship season. And so that, you know, in normal times, there's a 25 man active roster and now you're adding 35 to that. And so those 35 players would have been playing in single A, double A or triple A, you know, during the minor league season in a normal year. And so by taking those extra 35 players, it would be nearly impossible to field um, 160 minor league teams. So that was another factor that went into kind of minor league baseball canceling the season but we have uh, starting tomorrow july 3rd we are um those 60 players will be um beginning workouts in houston uh, we have two sites one is obviously the home of the astros minute Maid park uh and then we have an alternate site at the university of houston which is just under three miles away from minute Maid, essentially creating more social distancing and, and safe environments for our players to work out um, safely to social distance and to obviously contain any sort of uh, potential threat of infection. And so it's a very, very serious uh, enterprise that we've uh, we've got had to go through. Major League Baseball put out a an extremely long uh, COVID readiness and operations manual. So, you know, every player and staff member right now is getting tested before they're allowed into the facilities. They have to sit and wait for 48 hours to quarantine to make sure their tests come back negative. And then there's very strict protocols. Once uh, once you do start to come in every single day, you know, you have to fill out an exam, fill out a uh, questionnaire, uh, health exam, more or less uh, describing any symptoms that you may have, where you've been, things of that nature, temperature checks, and then, um, PCR testing, which is every other day, we'll be testing our players to make sure, players and staff, anyone in the facility to make sure that that they're safe and not exposed. So just when you think of how cumbersome it is to run a regular major league season, and now, you know, credit to our training staff. I mean, Jeremiah Randall's our head of life trainer and the rest of our medical team. They've been working 24 hours a day around the clock to kind of make this happen. And, and staff members throughout baseball have been doing it. So it's, um, it's going to be a, a grueling another grueling three weeks to kind of get us to opening day. But those are the things that are kind of happening on the front end. And then, as you mentioned, once spring training starts, we'll have kind of normal spring training workouts. that will be spread out throughout the day, uh, both at Minimate Park in Houston. And then once the regular season starts, the roster will be around 30. Uh, the active roster, the travel roster will be around 30. That will be reduced um, as weeks go on throughout the season down to, I think, 25 or 26. But then the, the players that the, the rest of the 60 players that, that aren't traveling with the club or on the active roster will be uh, working out in Corpus Christi, which is Whataburger Field, home of our double A club. When you advance from Fayetteville to the next level, you advance to Corpus Christi and Whataburger Field. And so a lot of our players are familiar with it. It's a great facility. We've just put in a ton of uh, a ton of player development improvements and new amenities. So it makes sense for us. It's within driving distance. We can get players to and from Houston quickly. And, you know, if needed to get those players on the road when the major league club is on a road trip, um, if needed, but they're essentially there in case there's injury or in case there's a COVID issue and there's, there's, there's various rules around it, which I, I won't get into. It's probably whole, worth a whole nother conversation, but more or less major league baseball has created a ton of flexibility to allow clubs to draw from this extra pool of players, many of which, you know, there's 13 of the 60 that were Fayetteville Woodpeckers last year. So it's one, uh, definitely something we're excited about. Yeah. 13 guys, like you mentioned that, that spent some time in Fayetteville last season, you really laid out kind of how the, the resources are being dispersed to these, these three different sites. What's it going to look like when the season starts in double a Corpus with, like you said, the taxi squad kind of working out and training there, What's that going to kind of look like once the season's going on? Because I think a lot of people are going to see the Major League Baseball on the field. 
Uh, but then how are these guys going to stay fresh and try to stay game ready if they're called upon up to the majors this year? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think they're still working through it. Uh, Jason Bell, who is our Miley coordinator, I was just talking to him yesterday about that very question. And similar testing protocols, um, all that's going to be maintained. But I think in general, there it sounds like we're going to try to maintain a normal schedule as if we were playing the seven o'clock game. So get players on their routine, get them in, um, you know, 12, one, two o'clock prep work treatment um, on the field for normal times for batting practice. And then um, I, I expect it'll be a, it'll be a spring training type workout early on, but I expect, you know, to get some competition going, they're going to probably have to do some sort of simulated games or mm-hmm. full on live inner squads, just because you, you can't expect players and certainly pitchers to, to go out from a, a bullpen workout in double a, and then, you know, get a phone call and the next night they have to be in Dodger stadium uh, in the eighth inning or the sixth inning, getting three big outs. And so um, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to, our player development staff is going to have to really focus on creating those competitive environments um, day in and day out and keeping those players motivated. But I expect they'll do a great job. We have a really talented staff and we have really, you know, the group of the group of 60 is extremely talented as well. So Looking forward to being a Fayetteville Woodpecker fan and seeing some of our former guys out there on TV. Yeah, 10 of the 13 guys, not a surprise maybe, are, are pitchers with how great the the staff in Fayetteville was last season. Uh, you mentioned, too, that just the idea that the starters aren't going to be built up to maybe go deep into games right away. That was kind of the sense that we got from some of our previous guests and talking to Brent Strom, the pitching coach, for example. Do you feel like the Astros are a little bit better well-equipped maybe being able to kind of roll out the bullpen strategy or just have this this huge crop of arms that can come out for short bursts. The Astros have been so good at developing pitching recently and a lot of competitive major league-ready arms. It, it, we might see some guys from Fayetteville contributing uh, to that cause, but how you know, how, how well-equipped are the Astros especially uh, for this sort of shortened sprint season and especially right out of the gates with, with guys coming out of the bullpen maybe a little more frequently? Well, two parts to your question. I, I definitely think that one of our competitive advantages is the strength and depth of our pitching throughout our farm system, and that you hit on it. We have a ton of power arms, guys with, with big-time swing and miss stuff. And, you know, they're still in the minor leagues for a reason, where, you know, they they can show flashes of greatness and then follow up and, and lack consistency uh, on their second outing or third outing down the road. But you know, if they can, many of these players, if they can kind of refine their skills, you know, refine their command, as far as stuff goes, we've got, we've got tons of swing and miss stuff that, that can get major league hitters out and can be, can impact a major league game, a major league season. So from that standpoint, I do think we're excited. It is a, it is a position of strength for us. And as far as kind of being ready to go, I mean, we have one of the best offenses in the American league, if not all of baseball, you know, typically, you know, players that, you know, you see players that have, oh, I start slow in April. That, unfortunately, like you said, is it's going to be a sprint. And so we don't really have players like that, but it happens to everybody. And, and there's, you never know when you're going to start slow, per se. And that's going to be a, a challenge for Dusty and our major league coaching staff to find the right matchups, to find the right players that are feeling good and consistently running them out there because it is a sprint. And 60 games, you don't want to start off the season on a nine, lose nine of 11 or lose 10 of 13 or, you know, 15 to 24 um, or whatever. The, the Nationals started 1931 or whatever it was last year and became world champs. And if that were to happen to any club this year, they've dug themselves too big of a hole to come back and even make the playoffs. And so uh, it will be, I think it's going to be fascinating. I think it's going to be incredible to watch Major League Baseball on TV, just to see it with no fans and to see um, all the all the changes that have happened, but at the same time, I think it expands the competition where teams that are on the cusp of being you know very good over the last several years that have been building up their farm systems, you know teams like the White Sox or the Cincinnati Reds in the in the in the, in the Central Division, you know the Rangers are going to be good. This continue to be good. Um, we've got our hands full. The American League West is really challenging, and we we have we do have to play uh, great right out of the start, but. We're capable of doing that. We've got Hall of Fame, you know, Hall of Fame pitcher Justin Verlander uh, at the top of our rotation. Zach Greinke right behind him. Lance McCullers is coming back. 
so I feel very, very confident in, in our club, but it's hard to, it's hard to, to put wind wins back to back to back together, uh, in any type of format, let alone knowing that you have to go out, uh, at a dead sprint and, and win early. Good stuff. L- last thing I have for you with, with the shortened season from your experience as a player and, and being in the front office following the game since, what do you feel like early in the season is there going to be an advantage to one side hitting or pitching early in the year with the shortened spring training? They It's a little bit less time than players are used to warming up for the start of the season. The downtime, who, who do you think that's an advantage for hitting or pitching? Um, You know, typically you see kind of pitchers uh, have an advantage early because hitters aren't, you know, used to it takes it takes some time to you know a lot of a lot of hitters come into spring training in the first few days they don't even swing the bat they're just tracking pitches trying to get their eyes back trying to get their timing back making sure that they're tracking and picking up the pitch so typically I think you see that um, but we did have you know we did have a strong we 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 got into the third week of games in spring training and so you know I know the layoffs been strong but a lot of the players have been you know working to kind of make sure that they're not in that position again. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's going to be any sort of distinct advantage. Um, I'm hopeful that we do have the advantage, but um, talent, talent plays. I mean, I think we have enough talent on our club that that the top to bottom one through nine, where if there are players struggling, we're deep enough, we can pick each other up that um, our lineup should, should continue to kind of be strong. So we hit on all that, the pitching depth, the depth of our offense, and I feel pretty good, regardless of how we come out, that uh, as a whole, collectively as a team, we'll be pretty good. All right, we want to thank our guests once again, Dan O'Neill, Senior Director of Business Operations uh, with the Houston Astros. Dan, stay safe, stay busy, I know you will, and uh, looking forward to uh, talking with you again when we have some some baseball to watch on TV. Excited for it. Yeah, thanks to all of our fans and podcast listeners. Uh, Fayetteville Baseball will be back stronger than ever in 21. We had so many exciting things planned for for 2020, and we're disappointed. But uh, just want to thank our fans, uh, the city of Fayetteville, the city council, um, our partners, and community leaders. It's um, it's been a, a great, albeit a disappointing experience. It's been a great experience to connect with all of you, and you know, looking forward to uh, bigger and better things in 21. So thanks for having me, Matt, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening. <music> Thanks again to each of our guests, Dan O'Neill, the Senior Director of Business Operations for the Houston Astros, as well as Colton Shaver, a catcher and corner infielder currently with the Houston Astros as part of their 60-man player pool. Biggest takeaway for me this week after talking to both of the guests I had on, I'm feeling a lot more optimistic, I think, just in general about baseball going on without a hitch, uh, or at least with with a few hiccups at minimum this year. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert or know what's going to happen at all with the current state of the world in this pandemic, but it put some of my concerns at ease, I think, hearing especially from Dan about all the protocols that are being taken in Houston to get ready for the season. Uh, Just hearing the buy-in, it really seemed like Colton Shaver genuinely felt like his best interests were Uh, being looked after in terms of keeping the players safe, keeping them as socially distant as possible. So I'm excited for the start of the Major League season, obviously, and and I think a little bit of renewed optimism, definitely for me. Uh, Some of my concerns were were put to rest at least uh, in terms of this season uh, going on as scheduled. So we're excited for that. Uh, We have a couple of other housekeeping bits to finish up, including... Uh, our Woodpeckers Rewind, where we look back at some of the top moments of the 2019 season. Uh, For this week, we're going to go back to June 30th of 2019, where the Woodpeckers blew a 3-0 lead and found themselves down by a run in the bottom of the 7th at Segura Stadium. Jake Adams comes up and uncorks a go-ahead grand slam as the Woodpeckers come from behind for a thrilling 8-4 win over Myrtle Beach in front of the Fayetteville fans. It was the first come-from-behind win in the seventh inning or later for the home team in Segra Stadium's history on June 30th 
of last season. We'll also check in on the OOTP Woodpeckers in our simulated season. We've continued to run on Out of the Park Baseball 21. Woodpeckers 4-2 and two in the last week. Uh, lost last Sunday on the road in Myrtle Beach before bouncing back with a four-game sweep uh, of Winston-Salem uh, and then a loss on the July 4th holiday on the road against the Carolina Mudcats, but uh, still a pretty solid season for the Woodpeckers so far. They've really turned it around in the second half. Uh, overall, they find themselves 42-37 and 37 on the season right now. That puts them nine games back of the Myrtle Beach Pelicans, but very much in the mix and a solid start with a winning record to begin the second half. Luis Santana had a massive week, 10 for his last 18 over the previous six games, including four doubles. He now leads the league with a 345 batting average and on base percentage over 400. He's top five in the league in that category, and the Woodpeckers have the league's two leading hitters by batting average. Freudis Nova, top five prospect in the Astros system, just behind Luis Santana still with a 340 average. So that's a look at our virtual Woodpeckers season, uh, four and two in the last week, and the Fayetteville Club, again, out to a solid turnaround in the second half. Thanks once again to both of our guests, and we hope that our listeners have a safe and enjoyable Independence Day holiday weekend. So happy 4th to everybody out there on our listenership on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. A reminder to like, share, and subscribe. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. Uh, it helps uh, our podcast get a little bit more attention. It works into the formula if you do give us a review. We hope it's five stars, but give us any type of review if you feel like we deserve it. Uh, so we appreciate that. Look forward to our guests getting those tied up for next week. Stay locked in on the Woodpeckers social media channels at Woodpeckers NC. If you are hoping to head out for some Woodpeckers gear on the holiday weekend, just a quick reminder, the Bird's Nest Team Store for our fans in Fayetteville is closed for the weekend, but it'll be resuming normal hours next week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday with limited hours to find out uh, when the team stores open. Check out FayettevilleWoodpeckers.com or follow the Woodpeckers on Twitter. So I'm Matt Dean, Broadcaster and Communications Coordinator for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. This has been episode number eight of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. <laughs>